This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Streaming services are the future of consuming film and television, which is a really funny sentence considering both film and television are outdated terms when speaking in that context. I don't think I'm the one that needs to tell you this, but you most likely have not one but a few subscriptions to some streaming services. Just a few weeks ago, HBO released their latest streaming service known as HBO Max, a service so overwhelming in my little opinion that I think it has the potential to be number one in a few years. That is if they play their cards right, their house of cards. If you know what I mean, oh wait, that's Netflix. And speaking of House of Cards, that brings me to my point that streaming services nowadays are more than just places to watch stuff. They most of the time are the ones making stuff, or at least funding and distributing the stuff that other people make, you know what I mean. With so many services, you might get overwhelmed, so I'm here to run down my thoughts on each major service, a little bit about them, and try to figure out which one will come out on top by, you guessed it, ranking them. There are too many services out there, so I'm sorry to the Fubo TV fandom, but I won't be talking about it. And before we get into it, as I mentioned earlier, streaming services are going to become the norm, and with that comes browsing the internet a lot. And with that said, ExpressVPN is a great service that lets you browse the internet safely. When you're browsing the internet, whether that be watching something on a streaming service, sending emails, whatever you do, you're sending a lot of information that is able to be seen by different parties before reaching that final destination. A VPN, a virtual private network, reroutes your connection through encrypted servers to keep your information private, as it should be. Because hey, if you're downloading Quibi, you want to keep that to yourself. As someone who has shopped around with different VPN services over the last few years, I can safely say ExpressVPN does it in the most secure and professional way. It's also super cool and kind of funny that ExpressVPN sponsored this video, because when you use this service, you're able to connect to any region in the world that you you want. So for example, I was able to access Canadian Netflix and they had a rival, I rewatched it, and I said yeah, that's a pretty good movie. The term geo-restricted goes right out the door with the help of ExpressVPN. You can find out how to get three months of ExpressVPN for free by clicking the link in the description or by going to expressvpn.com slash Karsten. So first off we have Quibi. Well that's all I gotta say about that. I got a seven day free trial of Apple TV Plus just for this video. Now I could leave it at that and you'd have plenty to take away from, but I guess I'll elaborate. Apple TV Plus, which is just a really clunky name in general, didn't take off and I don't really see it doing so in the future. I guess it's because it doesn't feel like they're bringing anything new to the table. I watched part of the Beastie Boys documentary before getting distracted and then I watched the first episode of the morning show and thought it was good, but just wasn't compelled enough to come back. Their stuff is super high quality, it feels expensive, and I wouldn't say it's not easy to digest, it's just not in inviting. Their layout is a total mess, it's just one giant box after another. I don't know if this is just me, but these boxes go black and don't do anything when you hover over them. Overall, it feels less like a streaming service and more like a website that has a few really high quality videos to watch. Maybe it'll make a big comeback somewhere in the future, but as of now, there are better places to put your money into. Does this even count? Who knows, but I've watched movies on it. YouTube has been trying really hard to legitimize themselves and turn into the norm, which makes absolutely no sense to me. The platform itself doesn't understand what it is, and with that in mind, imagine how it treats its creators. YouTube has a movie rental area, but if you want to get into their streaming service, it's offered through the premium subscription, which I have, and I must say, it's pretty nice when you want to listen to a podcast and not watch the video. There's also YouTube TV, which I download once a year to watch the Oscars and then delete the next morning. They have their YouTube originals, which have never really been known as the thing to check out. The last thing you'll ever hear in a conversation is, oh, you gotta check out that Logan Paul film. Even if they were, it never feels like the most inviting atmosphere to watch a movie. The recommendation bar being right there on the side with tons of other options just begs you to go watch something shorter. You can watch it full screen, of course, but the compression if you're picky is still kind of noticeable. If something is only on YouTube and not available anywhere else, which is the case with a lot of smaller underground films, of course I'll watch it there. But I'd be genuinely surprised and curious if this was anyone's first pick for their go-to streaming service. I just think YouTube is interesting and worth bringing up because at the moment this is Google's streaming platform. For being one of the biggest companies out there, you'd think they have a better service by now. It took me a while to give in to subscribing to Disney Plus because I didn't think there was much to get out of it other than a quick nostalgia kick. But I eventually did and I gotta say, they do a great job at introducing you to the service. The thing I love about Disney Plus is that it feels like one of their amusement parks. You enter and there are a few different categories you can lose yourself in, Marvel, Pixar, Star Wars, National Geographic, and a lot more. It's also such a flex to know each of these categories is guaranteed to have at least one really good film in them. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't pretty happy when I first logged on, it felt like a candy store. That's the thing, it'd be really easy for a service like this to be super overwhelming because, well, it's Disney. They have a ton of shit to watch and they map it out for you in a way that says what sounds like the most fun for you right now. It has a really nice, inviting look to it and 
That's all I can really say. The thing about Disney Plus is that I don't doubt it will continue to be a success, but it needs to do a lot more for me to regularly visit. Because personally, I like watching new films and discovering new stuff rather than watching old movies that will give me a small rush of nostalgia. That's nice, and Disney Plus is great at giving you that feeling, but it's so temporary. Like I mentioned before, it's like entering a candy store, and with that said, all the stuff they have feels like candy. It tastes really good in the moment, but what is it really doing for you? I have not seen Mandalorian, so I can't speak on that, but I've heard good things, so I can only assume they're pretty good at making making original content for streaming services. They just need to make uh, more of them. Is it a good service? Yeah, is this something that has the power to take down Netflix? Mm, probably not. HBO Max is the newest service on this list and I think it has so much potential. HBO has been doing the streaming thing for a while now with their services like HBO Go and HBO Now and I still don't entirely know the difference between the two, but now they have HBO Max, which is just those services but with a look that actually says, hey, this is a streaming service. HBO Max is brand new so I'll give it some time, but the interface right now is kind of a mess, which is understandable because similar to Disney Plus, it has so much content. They have categories and they have the goods, but the experience of going through the main homepage is so disorienting. Nothing against my man Elmo, but that's the thing you're highlighting at the top? It feels rushed and as though the people behind the service don't know everything they have to offer themselves. But HBO Max is huge because one, they have all the Ghibli films, two, they have all the HBO shows, three, they have a bunch of Adult Swim content, and four, they have... DC. My point is I think variety is something that makes a streaming service so good, especially when each pocket has the best shit out of that category. Like Disney Plus might have a lot of stuff, but HBO has the stuff that is not only bingeable, but quality. It isn't stuff you're gonna forget about the next week, or stuff you're nostalgic for. It's stuff like Barry, and The Wire, The Sopranos, all the Ghibli movies. Netflix is where you go to watch something while you get a really bad hand job. HBO Max is where you discover your new favorite movie. I found myself using Hulu a lot more these last few months. I used to make fun of it as being the equivalent of Burger King versus McDonald's, McDonald's being Netflix. But instead of doing what Burger King did and giving up completely, Hulu actually did the opposite. They're kind of on the rise. Something I've noticed about Hulu's content, at least from my experience, is that it's just a lot easier to digest. Also, hold that thought, I just logged on to look through their catalog and they're rolling out a watch party feature? Meaning I can watch Melancholia with my friends? Hell yeah! But like I was saying earlier, Hulu not only has content that feels easier to digest, but it also just treats its content a lot better. I like how rather than being just a collection of thumbnails, every piece of content has its own personal color and design. My issue with Hulu is its mobile interface. I know what you're thinking, why are you watching content on your phone? Like I said, Hulu is home to mostly digestible content like Bob's Burgers and Melancholia. I wouldn't say it's always sunny needs to be seen on the big screen. When watching stuff on my big ass phone, not to flex, sometimes I'll barely touch the screen and skip forward way too much out of nowhere. It could be a little more user friendly, that's all I'm saying. If you're gonna take away anything from this, it's that you should stop sleeping on Hulu. Prime Video is honestly probably my most used service. I watch a lot of movies, I have to, and Prime is most of the time guaranteed to have whatever film I need to watch available to rent. Either that, or it's available on Prime to stream, or it's available through an add-on like Stars, Fandor, Shudder, etc. They have a ton of indie movies, most of A24's catalog, they have a bunch of binge-worthy originals, Prime has got it going on. Something I really enjoy about Prime is their playback interface. Depending on what you're watching, the left-hand side might have trivia regarding the film, or the cast list for who is on screen. It's the perfect feature for trying to tell who is who in any Scorsese movie. I love Harvey Keitel. The playback interface is great, the browsing interface could be a lot better. Prime has way more to watch through the Prime subscription than I think Prime even realizes. I discover half of what they have to offer by accident just by searching the movie. But I also don't blame them, they have so much content you can only fit so much of that on the home screen. I guess the homepage is kinda decent now that I think about it, it's nothing special, but it organizes things as much as it can. I don't really know, as you can tell I think Prime is a great service, and until writing down these thoughts even I didn't realize how great it was. The Criterion channel focuses on Criterion films, classics, cult films, and basically anything that feels historically significant. It has a ton of stuff you can't find anywhere else, and it is a wet dream for any film student or professor. This service came to be after Filmstruck, a service attempting to do the same thing, had to shut down. After about a year of using Criterion, I gotta say, it is a fantastic service. The layout is clean and makes it super easy to bookmark films that interest you. They have these curated double feature things to help you figure out what to watch that night. Here's the thing, the Criterion collection is essentially a company built out of love love and appreciation for film restoration, film history, and, you know, films. That said, I just have a sense of trust when I browse what this service has to offer. I know that even if I don't like something they have to offer, it still feels significant in some way. There's a reason everything on the service is on the service. I don't have any huge issues with the interface, it's actually pretty straightforward. This isn't an ad, I promise, but you should really check out the Criterion channel if you're interested in film. 
Netflix is an insane thing to think about. It is a service that started as DVD rentals, then eventually started making original content like House of Cards starring nobody at all, and now it's looked at as the service that changed how we watch film and television. None of these services that I've talked about would be here, or at least be what they are currently, without Netflix and its success. I feel like every streaming service that comes out is doing their best to replicate Netflix and do a better job at it, and so far none have succeeded. And the thing is, I think it's well earned. It's a fantastic, while at times flawed, service. Netflix Netflix is really good at tailoring its content just for you, almost too good. Sometimes I get concerned and borderline annoyed at how specific my homepage gets. Like I get it, I like monkeys, move on. But I'd be lying if I said this personalization didn't suck me into the service. Services like HBO Max and Criterion may have more quality content, and when speaking about HBO Max, they have a lot of it, but Netflix knows how to skip through the bullshit and get you to that specific type of film that you want. I mean, not to mention the variety too. They have stand-up, true crime docs, originals, classics, anime, Noah Centineo. They have enough of each of those categories to make an entire other streaming service out of them. I can talk trash for days about all the Netflix originals that make me cringe, but they're also behind Marriage Story and Roma and The Irishman and 13th and more. They know exactly what they're doing and they've done some work to keep theaters alive. That's something I kind of really appreciate about Netflix. Not to humanize a brand, but aside from the fact that they really don't want you to watch the credits, they feel like the only streaming service that cares about film. In an industry that feels so set on moving forward and living in the digital age, Netflix is aware of what their platform is built on quality, gripping content. They not only have allowed for viewers like me to discover stuff I never would have otherwise, but they also allow filmmakers to make films they never would have otherwise. They got their issues, but you gotta hand it to them. If you don't have a Netflix subscription by now, you, uh, how old are you? With all these options, you never really have to go to the theater again. I mean, think about how much you're saving on ticket prices and Blu-rays and, <clears throat> well, I think that's all I have to say. Thanks for watching. Check out these streaming services and form your own opinion. Make sure to check out ExpressVPN and hey, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you.